there. Hello, everyone. I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We have a special guest. Can you please tell us who you are? Yeah, I'm Jason Ananda Josephson Storm. Uh, I'm a professor of religion and chair of science and technology studies at Williams College in the United States. Uh, in uh, I live on the uh, Massachusetts-Vermont border, so if that gives you a sense of the geography, yeah. Oh, excellent. And before we start in Australia, we have a, a tradition of sort of acknowledging our Indigenous um, elders, uh, past and present, so I just want to uh, do that. Now, the main thing we're going to talk to you about is the book you wrote, uh, The Invention of Religion in Japan. Before we do that, I just want to delve into religion itself a little bit. There's that idea out there that religion is basically universal. It's inherent in everything. You disagree with that. Why? Yeah. So I should start there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that there is a fairly na naive idea that the category religion is totally transparent and that it can be found everywhere and that it has a certain set of features that people associate with it. Like, I don't know, everybody has a faith or everybody has some kind of worldview or everybody has some kind of identity through which that worldview uh, is attached or, or something like that. And it turns out that um, this notion uh, of religion can be both historicized and relativized. Uh, it turns out that it emerged uh, at a particular moment quite late in European history, basically uh, after the Protestant Reformation, but even later than that. Um, and um, it uh, it brought with it a lot of baggage that that doesn't didn't apply to a lot of things that were going on in Europe and even more so doesn't fit well with other cultures outside of the broadly speaking Abrahamic frame. Uh, even within Europe, uh, Judaism, for example, never fit cleanly uh, in or without the category religion. Um, and when you globalize it, uh, it turns out that a lot of peoples in different parts of the world um, don't don't have uh, indigenous words for something that we would call religion, and it can be hard to for them to identify exactly what part of their culture is being demarcated and talked about as if it's religion. And so, for for those reasons, I I want to problematize that category. I can qualify this in various ways, but that's the big big piece. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. And you mention in the book that you emphasize it was created by Japanese people. It wasn't sort of Westerners coming and saying, well, this will be religion in Japan, that it was the, the Japanese that had a, a, a big say in how that would develop. What's the kind of implications of that? What would have been the difference if if the West did it versus the, the, the Japanese? Yeah, I mean, it was a it was an international process. So just to give you something concrete uh, for your listeners to, to um, track. So in 1853, U.S. warships show up off to the coast of Japan and demand that the Japanese government uh, sign a bunch of treaties that guarantee freedom of quote unquote religion. Uh, this was in part the US, it was gunboat diplomacy. Really what was at stake was in part um, trade, uh, but it always sounds good uh, when we talk about human rights. And so this was freedom of religion. And Japanese thinkers encountering that term religion had no idea what it meant. They weren't sure what the Europeans wanted them to guarantee. The word rights also was uh, was new to them. Um, and uh, they were struck by a confrontation with these new systems of power and including basically guns and, and what we might think of as modern technologies that Japan had been in certain respects isolated from. So there's a very intense diplomatic context and one in which they're not exactly equal players. So uh, the Europeans or the Americans and then you know soon British warships showed up, Russian warships, French, making similar demands, um, they did have the upper hand in the negotiation. So I'm not saying that they played no role in it. And they're the ones that set up the uh, set up the problem, set up the tasks that Japanese leaders would have to solve. Uh, if we want to enter modernity, Japanese thinkers quickly learned, or we want to um, survive and not be colonized, we need to be able to say that we guarantee something called freedom of religion. And so rather than it being, so I'm not saying that it wasn't imposed, but it wasn't imposed unilaterally. It turns out that the Japanese thinkers had a lot of agency. Uh, they had, to, they got to say, um, they got, they debated amongst each other what could, how should we translate this word religion? What's implied if we translate it in way A or in way B? Um, they ended up, there was no uh, indigenous term that mapped onto the term religion. And so they ended up creating new terms, uh, particularly two new important terms, um, shinkyo and shukyo, um, each of which meant something slightly different, but that let them 
um, protect the kinds of things that they thought that they needed to protect while um, opening the way for Christian missionaries, which was what they realized pretty quickly was what was mainly being demanded of them. Um, and so I think unlike places like the Philippines, where um, European hegemony kind of defined the category of religion and then decided that nothing on the ground counted as religions and therefore um, contributed to basically expunging many indigenous traditions in the Philippines almost completely, J Japan, the, the capacity of Japanese thinkers to resist, let them demarcate certain spaces as protected religions and including things like Buddhism, which became uh, defined in a new way uh, as a member of the category religion. But in that act of definition, it changed things on the ground in really radical ways. Buddhism, uh, I want to argue, was really transformed in 19th century Japan uh, in, in ways that um, had, all to, had a lot to do with this encounter and new kinds of classification. Yeah. And we talk about religion, but you mentioned in your book that we should be kind of careful how we view that term. Can you go into that a bit more? Yeah. I mean, again, it's a term, um, you know, when we say the word religion, there's many different ways that we can talk past each other. And it's not immediately clear uh, what whether um, the we might think that there are different kinds of social kinds at stake, all of which could be referenced by the term religion. And what I want to suggest is that uh, when in the 19th century Japanese thinkers encountered the term religion, for instance, it drew along uh, a couple of their oppositions, an idea that the religious was separate from the secular or kind of secular politics, the idea that religious was separate from science, uh, the idea that religion was separate from something called superstition, which was supposed to be the um, dark mirror of religion, its closest sibling, but also the thing that it most needed to stamp out. And so in particular, those um, differentiations were incredibly unfamiliar to Japanese thinkers, and uh, they had to respond to them. Those are the ones that are the, really the hardest to globalize. And if you think about it, even within the Euro-American context, um, keeping this, those distinctions alive uh, is kind of hard. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that cross from uh, the categories of, for instance, secular politics and religion, or you know, or the very definitions of whether something is a political thing or is a religious thing, or whether some practice is a scientific practice or a superstitious practice, or you know, believe or what have you, all of those things are subject to intense contestation. Uh, and so what I wanted to track in the book was kind of a, a history of law, a history of ideas, uh, a history of cultural changes that come along with that vocabulary. And they've changed somewhat even today from the period of the 19th century. One of the things that's interesting is that now um, uh, by the 20th century, uh, the status of Buddhism in the category of religion became more globally established and that changed the definitions of religion. Uh, for instance, in the, in the period of early diplomatic encounter, um, you know, the European thinkers weren't sure if anything except basically, you know, Christianity uh, and Islam, et cetera, et cetera, fit well into the category. And um, even today, there's some ambivalences around whether Buddhism is best thought of as a philosophy or a religion or what, you know, what exactly defines Buddhism uh, itself. And a lot of that is a product of the process that I kind of trace uh, in that book um, in, in some detail, focusing primarily on the Japanese side. I thought of it as a kind of reverse anthropology. This is an encounter moment that a ton of people have written about the European perspective on encountering non-Europeans and trying to figure out what their deal was. But what I was interested in was the Japanese folks on the other side of that encounter. And uh, they had all these interesting writings about Europeans and Americans and Australians, et cetera, in that moment. And um, those writings had been generally ignored. Um, they weren't translated, et cetera, et cetera. And so part of one of the sor sets of sources I excavate in the book are those. And I go back also to look at the structures and systems of thought that the Japanese um, elite had even before the moment of encounter. There were different categories that they fit things like Buddhism into, um, uh, categories that they fit um, things like Shinto into or whatever, and those don't map cleanly onto the Euro-American categories that they then encountered in the 19th century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I talked too quickly too. No, I'm sorry. No, that's uh, fine. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. You mentioned before the warships. Can you kind of set the scene, what Japan was like in the 1800s when, yeah. when they showed up, when the, when the warships Sh showed up? Sure. So... Um, to, to, to flash back to a, another earlier moment that, that was key that'll set us up for where Japan was in the 19th century, um, in, the 18, in the 1550s, the Japanese had had an earlier encounter with Europeans, mostly with Portuguese, but also some Brits um, and uh, some uh, folks from what would become the Netherlands. And uh, basically, the Europeans were attempting to forcibly 
include Japan in different ways. Basically, paying a certain daimyo allied with the, certain Japanese rulers allied with the Europeans who are willing to convert to Christianity and even send Japanese people as slaves to function uh, among in European colonies. And the Japanese government, for understandable reasons, freaked out and closed the country. Not completely, but in many ways to European contact. And the country was with the exception of a key trading point with the Netherlands and some trade with China, closed in the roughly closed in the period from about 1604 to 1853. Um, and so in that period, uh, sometimes called the Tokugawa or Edo period, um, there was a the Japanese government articulate, there were a lot of developments internal to Japan, the rise of mass literacy, uh, a new uh, perhaps proto-capitalist or at least currency-based economy, um, the, uh, the but, uh, deepening development of the samurai class who were articulated in that period. Um, so uh, it doesn't fit clean periodization the way that folks coming out of a European uh, historical context want to divide things from perhaps, let's say, the medieval to the Renaissance to the modern, but it was its own historical trajectory where a bunch of things were happening. And in that context, um, one of the things that was very interesting to me is that they are importing selected European works, but they're censoring them for any reference to Christianity under the assumption that Christianity was a kind of warped heretical Buddhist tradition that kind of got Buddhism wrong and that was trying to ferment rebellion and lead toward conquest. And so, um, they, but they didn't really know what Christianity was. So they also crossed out things like parts of Euclid's geometry, uh, references to first principles. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that they censored, but they imported European scientific works in this period and was struck out all the Christian language. And in that respect, um, they had a kind of secular European science, quote unquote, secular European science before anything like that actually existed in the European historical context. And then uh, Japanese experts in something called rangaku or Dutch studies started to formulate or develop even on the sciences that they were importing uh, in this particular framework. Um, anyway, there's a lot more I go into in the book about that, but it becomes uh, very important. Um, this, yeah, anyway, it, it sort of gives this whole version of what some scholars have called a parallel modernity runs aground or crashes in to the global um, world order in the 1850s and 1860s. And a lot of it gets wiped away. Um, whole categories, whole texts, the whole educational system. There's massive, massive upheaval and reform. Uh, the Japanese have a Japanese government launches basically a revolution in 1868. And then uh, Japan starts to quote unquote modernize and, 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 and leaves the baggage of this period behind. Um, but it's very interesting as an intellectual historian or as a historical or as a cultural or a religious historian to look across that divide because we can see a culture in relative isolation developing independent uh, relatively independent from other aspects of the world system then confronts the world system and then has to figure out how to deal with it um, and so what was really interesting to me when i did my dissertation in particular was to look back and forth across this divide as a kind of massive rupture and look at the before and after um yeah now, the Europeans, you mentioned in the book, they, they had that view that, you know, Christianity is the right one and then there's these other religions out there. Did you find any evidence of a kind of a strong acceptance of other faiths in Europe at all? Was there any movements you came across that went, you know what, we can all exist, we can all be right, that sort of thing? Or was it all kind of, you're, Christianity is the right one, the rest of you, you know, there might be some good things in there, but you're all wrong. Um, there were some exceptions. There was, um, for instance, by not in the very earliest period, not in the 1850s, but by the later in the 19th century, we start to get um, Unitarian Universalists of different sorts who, who have a much more ecumenical orientation toward um, uh, multi-faith traditions. Um, and we have, I mean, I'm sure that back home there were uh, some uh, liberal groups that, that, that had a more tolerant stance, but they weren't the ones sending uh, missionaries to Japan. So, um, uh, but also then uh, by the 1880s, we start to also have theosophical uh, society groups who then theosophical society claimed for itself the mantle of a kind of Buddhism based on this idea that um, Helena Blavatsky, a Russian, anyway, I could took a long tangent there, but they sort of uh, had an occult new age form of uh, Western Buddhism. Uh, and they started sending people to Japan in ways that had, you know, ended up having complicated interactions with Japanese people on the ground. It both seemed to support Support Buddhism uh, and its potential universality, but then also the Japanese folk were often struck by how weird uh, the theosophical version of Buddhism was. So, um, no, I don't. It's not just one narrative of, of European um, 
uh, intolerance, let's say. But I will note that the people who were most actively engaged in missionary efforts to Japan were some of the more intolerant. And when they got there, they often, and I have tons of textual evidence for this, said, you know, uh, there's no religion in Japan. What's Buddhism is really just a superstition or an outmoded uh, form of, um, uh, you know, uh, um, something you know, either di diabolical or idolatrous or superstitious. Uh, and it, we need to get rid of it. Um, and so uh, one of the things that ha ended up happening was a kind of pushback against that by Japanese Buddhist leaders. Um, yeah. But I think then the Unitarians came in and some of them were not much nicer. And so there's also uh, an interesting book by uh, a uh, scholar named uh, Michel Moore uh, about uh, Unitarians in Japan, if you want the the, the more upbeat side of, of that narrative. But it was pretty slim. They had an influence at a few a few elite thinkers, uh, a few elite Japanese uh, thinkers, but otherwise um, they weren't numerically very big on the ground. Yeah. Now you mentioned in the book freedom of religion and how the Japanese were able to get around that if they said, well, this is technically not a religion, so therefore we can force you to to, to follow it. Uh, can you go into detail about that, please? Yeah. So the Japanese government actually sent out. Uh, what we could call diplomats or anthropologists. These were trained elites that they went out to European countries. And one of the central things they were trying to figure out was what is religion and what are the different ways of organizing a polity in relationship to religion? And one of the things that they noted was in many parts of Europe, um, you had uh, very different ways of drawing the line between what counted as religious and what counted as political. For instance, you could uh, have orders that, um, you know, the idea that, the, you know, the Queen of England that is both the head of the church and the head of the state uh, nominally, um, or you could have investiture ceremonies uh, in the United States where people are swearing on Bibles, even though the the United States claims to have a complete separation of church and state um, uh, and what have you. We could keep going to the different variations. And they they literally compiled and compared constitutions. And they, they um, wrote quite a bit about different possible ways of translating this term religion that would imply protecting certain things and enshrining other things on the side of the state or uh, on the side of the educational institution. And their end up their, their takeaway, what they ended up doing, which might seem very strange to outsiders, uh, is that they ended up arguing that something called Shinto, uh, which was a, a kind of an invented tradition, um, uh, basically, it had some antecedents, but it was in the process of becoming invented in the 19th century, um, that this Shinto was a uh, either a, a secular politics or even a science. And as such, uh, or at least a, a key core of it, as such was uh, you can have freedom of religion as long as you were also Shinto, which sounds you know contradictory, but that's the way that they wanted to argue for, or at least insofar as they argued that an abbreviated form of Shinto was kind of universal. Uh, this form of Shinto had recognized certain facts, quote unquote. One of those quote unquote facts was that the emperor was divinely descended from the sun goddess. This was not a matter of faith or personal belief, according to the Japanese state, but just a fact. Uh, and they taught it in textbooks alongside things like uh, the uh, solar system model with the sun at the center. You know, in, in every other respect, it was communicated as a as a kind of fact and center of Japanese ideology um, or, or cent center sort of a, of the state project. And they um, adapted a whole uh, set of norms uh, and political norms or legal norms uh, and rituals that had come from Shinto, basically, in one way or another. Um, and so uh, they argued that it was both the ethical foundation of politics and that it was a kind of science, that it provided knowledge about the gods, uh, the essence of Japan and, and their workings. Uh, it shifted from being a science over time uh, when it didn't work well in the laboratory. They really did try that uh, into being a kind of literary science. And so then it became a kind of study of national literature, but it was understood still as excavating the essence of Japan. Um, and then they tried to argue that, uh, and there were a couple of famous cases in which Christians would say, oh, no, no, we we can't bow to the emperor, that's idolatry or what have you. Um, this should be protected by our freedom of religion. And in especially the period of increasing Japanese militarism in the 30s and what have you, the courts ruled against that and ended up saying, no, you, you, you can, yeah, do your Christianity, that's fine, but it can't interfere with your duty to the emperor and your, your reverence for um, the kami, for the indigenous spirits or deities of Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, and that compromise, um, you know, that, that functioned, it was internally consistent. But then uh, after the Second World War, the Japanese government was then even more literally forced to embrace a constitution uh, by the American powers, 
that enshrined a much more rigorous distinction between um, religion and politics, even more rigorous than is the case in the United States uh, or even in France, um, uh, even than French notions of laïcité. And this new form uh, of secular of the secular state very specifically came to classify Shinto as a religion and therefore relegate it to merely um, one kind of optional belief among others. Uh, and that, but that happened in the post-war period. Um, that's sort of the status of it uh, today. Although if you interview Japanese folks on the ground, they still um, uh, don't tend to use the category uh, religion in the same way that European folks do, um, insofar as many of the presuppositions built into it, such that you know people are supposed to be only members of one religion. Uh, uh, or um, religion is identified with faith, et cetera, et cetera. Most Japanese folks, even with the modern word shukyo, uh, don't have those associations. So they often go to multiple what we could call religions, and they don't think that belief is central or faith is central to their quote unquote um, Shinto or Buddhist practice and so on. Uh, so, um, but they do recognize a, a taxonomy, a category hierarchy that that includes tends to include Shinto and Buddhism and Christianity uh, and Islam under that new category of shukyo. Yeah. And you said in the book that the flip side is with superstitions that you can say, well, you're not technically a religion, so therefore we don't have to uh, give you freedom of religion. Can you go into that for us? Yeah, for sure. So um, one of the things that was true in 19th century law, not just in Japan, but in um, other parts of the world, uh, including Great Britain, uh, I, I'm, I don't know Australian law, but I imagine it was similar, um, was that there were legal ordinances that I um, banned in some respects uh, Superstition or fraudulent religion, sometimes uh, associated with uh, witchcraft or divination, but otherwise sometimes considered bad or backward practices. And the Japanese government um, translated, invented a new word for superstition, uh, in this case modeled uh, on the German. Um, uh, the Japanese term uh, um, is uh, meishin, uh, errant belief or aberrant belief. Uh, and it ended up outlawing a, a whole bunch of things, including um, some indigenous, what we might call mountain uh, worship practices. Uh, some kinds of what we might call faith healing, uh, and uh, including they for a while tried to outlaw belief in a whole range of supernatural creatures, including uh, uh, Tengu, which are kind of winged goblin, uh, and various kinds of monsters or demonic entities. And the irony is that um, then uh, th this uh, there was you know some kind in the pre-modern period, or let's say a pre-modern period in the pre-contact period, there were certain kind of entities that were roughly considered on par. And the example I used to close out the book is that uh, many Japanese folks in let's say 1800 uh, described three kinds of entities. The, they described uh, the um, Tenno, who's the who was the figure of the emperor, uh, the Shitenno, who are the four uh, divine kings who are associated with Buddhism, uh, and then Gozu Tenno, the ox-headed emperor associated with plagues. Uh, in the period after uh, the encounter with um, uh, the with Europe and the creation of a category religion, the uh, status of the emperor was enshrined as part of the secular state. Uh, belief in the Shitenno, the four guardian kings, was considered religious and totally optional. And belief in Gozutenno, the god of plagues, was considered a backward superstition that no one was supposed to believe in anymore. Uh, and so uh, in that respect, um, and a lot of people on the ground didn't do what the state wanted them to do. So the state tried to, for instance, uh, ban belief that uh, in spirit foxes, uh, which was a common belief in the period. And I found some interesting stuff in the archive of um, folks writing back to their local um, political representative, and they're like, fear spirit you told the spirit boxes aren't real, but they're plaguing my family and I want you to do something about them. Uh, and, or uh, even uh, accusations that the, um, people who were trying to ban spirit foxes were themselves motivated by demonically, basically. So um, there's a, uh, there's a uh, yeah, anyway, an interesting, complicated moment of nuance. And then the other oddity, um, which almost inspired another book of mine, but I ended up not writing this one, is that the category of ghosts is a bit of a mess because initially the Japanese state starts to try and get rid of ghost belief as a backward superstition, but then they see and hear about spiritualism and table turning and seances in Europe, and they think, oh, no, no, wait, maybe ghosts are scientifically verified or at least um, something that might, you know, that we, we don't have such a, a hard stance toward. And so uh, the ghosts kind of creep back in. And instead of, unlike other categories of belief in which the Japanese state is mobilizing resources against, uh, there, there, there becomes a kind of key pivot moment where, in a certain respects, the Japanese state promotes the 
the idea of ancestral spirits and ghosts. Uh, and um, they think that they're, and this happens alongside knowledge of European traditions like the seances and the table turning and spiritualism that are uh, happening in roughly the same period. Yeah. So that urge to kind of stamp out the superstitions, is that mainly because, well, we want to get rid of the competition and we want you to focus on ours, or is it was a genuine dislike for superstitions thought, well, we're backward, it's, it's not a good thing to have? Um, I think that the, there are two things. I think that the from a um, there was both the idea that superstitions were the things that were obstacles to modernity and modernization. This was the so the idea is that certain kinds of beliefs or practices are quote unquote archaic. Most of them aren't necessarily historically that, but uh, and that having them is backward. And this is an idea that formulates itself um, in the European historical context, sort of in the 18th century, and then pushes forward from that. Um, but there's also an irony in that the, the kinds of things that got defined as superstitious belief, as backward belief, were often the darker or more demonic entities. So even in, let's say, a Christian context, um, people often classified belief in uh, the active presence of demons as superstitious, but belief in the active presence of guardian angels as merely a matter of religious belief. And so um, you can see how something is sort of, so is being mobilized um, against, um, yeah, the kind of demonic by denying it, by, by kind of arguing it out of existence. But it's true in polemical encounter, uh, leaders from different, um, what would become religious groups often accuse the other of superstition and of being backward, uh, of, of being not really religious, and or of being incompatible with science. And over time, superstition shifted from being primarily an opposite to religion to being primarily an opposite to science. And so what meant, meant something superstitious, you know, in the early Christian context, uh, the term superstitio, uh, well, emerges early in um, uh, Greco-Roman antiquity, goes underground, resurges uh, in and around um, the Renaissance and then Reformation um, as the uh, an, uh, as the op as kind of pa a pagan term or a paganizing term. So, what counts as superstitious is basically um, European folk practices that are still understood as "quote unquote" pagan or heathen. Um, but then, uh, starting under the influence of think thinkers like Francis Bacon, I have a whole separate book on this, by the way. If you if y'all want to read that stuff, um, it 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 starts to take on science as its opposite. And so, it, the Japanese context, you know, it's coming late in that process, but still in a transitional moment. So, when missionaries and activists are arriving in Japan in the mid 19th century, uh, superstition is both seen as pagan or the contrary to Christianity and as the contrary to science. But over time, um, especially in the wake of Darwin and others, uh, science really takes on the a kind of cultural prestige. And then what gets flagged as backward also gets often marked as pseudoscience or unscientific. Yeah. And there are comedians who talk about that saying that someone will be, say, a Christian and think that will believe a bunch of things and then say to other religions, oh, so silly, how can you believe that? And you're like, well, yes, they say that about your religion as well. Can you tell us a bit yeah. more about secular Shinto? Yeah, so um, one of the chapters in my book is exactly about this operation where Shinto got enshrined on the side of the secular state. And that's and one of the uh, things scholars who have noticed before you know, the, the role of Shinto in the Japanese constitution. So this is after 1889, the Japanese constitution uh, uh, grants freedom of religion, but then it says Shinto is not a religion. And so people who have seen that before uh, had tended to say, oh, it's just them being tricky. Um, and uh, they didn't really think it wasn't a religion. And they were, you know, something, something, something. But actually, uh, if you trace it back, um, because Shinto, I want to argue, and I have a lot of textual evidence and some other ally scholars, um, was basically an invented tradition in the 19th century, not just at the moment of encounter, but much earlier, basically the late 18th, early 19th century, where uh, in that context, uh, Japanese thinkers in a way tried to um, discover or recover an indigenous tradition that had been um, largely subsumed by Buddhism. And in the context of inventing a new thing called Shinto, fairly quickly they allied it with imported uh, European astronomical texts uh, and uh, European, um, what we might call um, um, uh, medicine and even political texts. And so there was a way in which, uh, and they presented it um, according to a vocabulary that if we were going to translate it literally would be um, science. So uh, the uh, Kokogaku National Science. And so, um, the, and, and in so doing, they were reviving a kind of philology, a kind of archaeology. They even did uh, astronomical observations, but ones that they claimed confirmed the truth of Shinto, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and but they also had argued already uh, by you know the 1820s and 1830s that Shinto um, represented a new form of statecraft. 
that it could anchor the government in a new way, uh, in part um, without the influence of Buddhism. For various reasons, these guys were coming to think of themselves. It was a rise of a different professional class, a displacement of the monastic elites from the center of the state and the educational system, and uh, an attempt to kind of um, you know, reconfigure what it meant to be Japanese. Um, and ha so, and in that context, they had already uh, come to argue that Shinto was something distinct from Buddhism, that it had a kind of scientific quality to it, um, that it uh, was closer to, yeah, a kind of statecraft. And the language for it in Japanese was um, koktai. So it was the about producing a nation body. Uh, or in other words, it was a kind of nationalism, we might say today, uh, not a kind of religion. Uh, and so uh, in that respect, those arguments were ready at hand once the category religion was imported um, and debated in the 1850s and 1860s. Um, and now, they never became... Uh, yeah, so the people promoting these were not the whole of the Japanese populace, but a narrow group of folks who happened to be a very influential uh, in the post-revolutionary government in the 1860s and 70s. Um, but yeah, so that's that's how they formulated something that was a kind of Shinto secular. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, before that Japanese people visited Europe to kind of learn about how they did things. Yeah. What were some of the other kind of insights for them when they did this visit? Yeah, um, so yeah, so there's this... Um, a lot of interesting things. Um, they were, uh, you know, things that struck them were about uh, uh, some of what they were baffled by was the uh, definitions of different kinds of categories. What's supposed to be the difference between philosophy and religion, for instance, was one that they criticized. Or um, if a state is committed to an enlightenment and to the advancement of knowledge, why is it uh, wh what does that mean? Does that necessitate materialism or does it not? Is it weird that it, it seems weird that it seems that some folks think it necessitates materialism? Can you found an ethical order on a kind of scientific determinism? Um, but then also there were these interesting writings about um, the, the Japanese thinkers came back with even later in the period where, um, you know, uh, the ways that science was positioned, that they were critical of. Science seems to have taken on for, for them. They were recognizing the strange cultural prestige that, that science seemed to have in the European context. Um, there are also interesting writings about economics from the period where they uh, are surprised by, um, you know, uh, the beginning of debt-based economies and other things. Um, but yeah, what I was focused in on was their, um, yeah, ca the questions around what this term religion might mean, what science might mean, what superstition might mean. Um, and really they came up with a very, very different ways to answer that question. Uh, in a key chapter of the book, I look at uh, a range of these different anthropologists, if you will, or at least cultural transmitters, and the different terms that they used to try and translate the word religion. And they came up with at least half a dozen. And then they would, uh, in the in the um, pages of Japan's first major academic journal, the Meido Kuzashi, they debated, you know, what is religion? How do we define it? If we define it, translate it with this term, that seems to imply this and these oppositions. But so maybe we should define it with this other term, you know, and so so uh, in, in that respect, um, I found that particularly interesting and, and compelling. Yeah. And you talked about heresy in the book and the, the great counselor who got ambushed out the front of his, when he's walking around. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So one might ask, um, and, you know, somebody asked me this when I was even writing it as a dissertation. I had this um, as a, a challenge from one of my um, dissertation committee. So he said, well, OK, you're saying that they invented, you know, the category religion in um, basically the 1850s and the 1880s, but they had encountered Christianity for the first time in the 1400s. Uh, what, you know, at the end of the end of the 1400s, beginning of the 1500s, what terms did they use to describe Christianity? Didn't they have a term for religion then? Um, and going back into the archives, um, what they had was a term uh, the main term that they, two terms that they use, well, uh, Josh Schumann was a was a key term, um, and uh, or and they also use Jaho and and other related terms with this Ja prefix, and uh, that that vocabulary had been um, well articulated within Buddhism to describe internal factions within Buddhism that had become demonically corrupted. So literally, uh, it's kind of warped uh, sect. And so 
um, uh, in, in that respect, uh, it, it, it's located in what other folks have called um, Buddhist heresiological discourse. And so Buddhism, unlike Christianity, didn't have a single orthodoxy, uh, uh, but Buddhism did, Buddhist thinkers occasionally did declare certain things totally out of bounds. Like, you know, if you're running around spreading the idea that, you know, have, monks should all have sex or something, for instance, which was a famous early uh, movement, uh, supposedly, uh, that then they would use this term to describe it, this kind of heresy. They were described as a heresy. And so when Japanese thinkers first encountered Christianity, it was Buddhist leaders who were front and center at the encounter, in part because the European thinkers were putting themselves in dial in this dialogue. And um, some of the key translators of the early encounter um, were ass assimilating Christianity to Buddhism. So Christianity was being translated instead of God, uh, was translated as Dainichi. So uh, Dainichi Nyorai, the cosmic, the great solar cosmic Buddha. And so uh, under that context, though, Christianity had several distinct features features that seem to be, once Japanese thinkers started looking at it very closely, very, very, very different from Buddhism. And so they came to understand it with this term, um, heresy. And that implicit in that term heresy was the idea that it was demonically inspired. And there were these Buddhist scriptures written in China. So they're not ancient Indian scriptures, but more late Chinese scriptures that described uh, what, what I'm translating as heresy as a kind of demonic epidemiology. Demons come around. They, they're kind of like diseases. People can catch them. And one of the kinds of demonic diseases you can catch is the uh, desire to destroy other people's statues. Basically, uh, anti idolatry iconoclasm was understood as a demonic pathology and when european thinker thinkers started pointing at statues of the buddhas and calling them idols and trying to say that they should be burned it was very quickly the japanese state was like okay you know this is a kind of buddhist heresy uh to, to take a step back some early buddhist thinkers were um thought that that, that uh, Christianity was just another sect of Buddhism and they were going to let it in until uh, uh, in, in versions of this um, anti-idolatry discourse and, and some other things popped up and that made that seem impossible. And then the insistence by Christian leaders that um, the word God or Deus could not be translated, uh, that really didn't make it feel like a kind of Buddhism that they were familiar with. So uh, for, for a bunch of different reasons, um, they classified it as a kind of demonic heresy. Yeah. And so uh, already in the 1850s, or still in the 1850s, that was the language around which they talked about Christianity. Because you might also want to know, in the period when they're being asked to guarantee freedom of religion, they know that Christianity is at stake. What word are they using to refer to Christianity? And it is demonic heresy, basically. And so that's what they thought that they were first trying to keep out. But then they realized they couldn't keep it out anymore. And then they started to soften the language. Um, but then, you know, if what you think uh, the word religion means is like demonic heresy that you're willing to permit for reasons of politics, you know, that causes you to translate the category in a different way than if there are indigenous things in Japan that you include in that category. So there's a, there are a lot of interesting debates. And I looked at the writings uh, and the documents exchanged by the early translators uh, on these diplomatic treaties. And they are often using this language of heresy in private communications, but they're, it's not the word that they're putting in uh, when they're coming down to translate the treaties. Yeah. And you talk in the book about the Indian Buddhists that came to visit who actually weren't that Buddhist. Can you talk a bit about that? Um, there, well, they first thought the, so initially um, when Japanese thinkers encountered um, European missionaries, they thought that they were from India and they often had uh, um, Europeans with them. And so they had gone by way of Goa uh, and in other parts of South Asia. And so, you know, when um, uh, uh, folks said, you know, when uh, 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 Francisco Javier uh, said, you know, that he came by way of, um, India, they, you know, they, they thought they had no idea where Europe was. And so they thought India, uh, Jambudvipa was this massive continent and that Europe was like a little appendage at the edge of India. And they knew China uh, quite much more intimately and they had fairly good maps of China uh, and Korea, but they thought of Europe as like this little kind of backwater part of India. And so, um, and when um, Christian missionaries came to them, they often brought with them other South Asian uh, uh, folks who had been recently converted. And so that further muddied the waters. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there are various good cultural misunderstandings and attempts to figure out what was going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and with violence when it comes to religion. So with the with the council who got murdered, was was religious violence prominent in Japan? No, no, it's it's unusual. In part, um, well, no, I'll take a step back. There, there are exceptions. So there, um, in the period before the eighteen, let's say the eighteen thirties. 
where the state was pretty good at pacifying different kinds of opposition. Now, if you if you go back way earlier than that, like let's say the 1550s or the 1540s or the 1400s, uh, there, at that period, different Buddhist institutions often had their own um, um, Sohe who were monastic warriors and actually had weapons and what have you. Now, they weren't fighting each other on quote unquote religious grounds often, but they stuck, stuck um, con took control of territories in ways that often competed with Japanese samurai, et cetera. But, but they weren't, um, for the most part saying, you know, we're going to kill you because you have a different religion. They were saying, you know, this is our territory or what have you. Uh, but in the, in the starting in roughly the 1820s, uh, you start to get a kind of Shinto that's differentiating itself from Buddhism. And then you start to get some sparking off points of conflict. And, um, Irrespective of all that, there had been also a history of anti-heresy activity within Japan from the period, the closed country period, where um, being a practitioner of a heresy or being a practitioner of what we might call um, um, some kind of um, witchcraft, although I don't want to make it too close a parallel to the European context, but let's just call it witchcraft, um, was considered um, a crime. And so, you know, basically like working with demons and malevolent forces was considered uh, a crime. And people who were heretics were seen as working with demons and malevolent forces. And there was some violence against them at, at earlier periods. But the kind of violence, the assassination of uh, Inosuke, who's the figure who gets killed for being a heretic um, uh, in the 1850s, that's unusual. That's unprecedented. And it comes out of a period of, you know, um, the energy that's boiling up to the revolution that's going to happen. Uh, uh, and and um, yeah, anyway. Can you talk a little bit about um, the study of religion in Japan? So one of the things that then happens when they're trying to figure out um, what religion is and what to ca categorize as religion is that they then also send Japanese thinkers a little later in the period, especially after the 1880s. After the 1880s, they've guaranteed freedom of religion, but um, and they've decided that Buddhism is a religion, probably, or part of Buddhism. Most Buddhism is a religion, uh, that uh, Confucianism is not a religion and that Shinto is not a religion. Uh, they start sending uh, Japanese uh, Japanese Buddhist institutions in particular, discovering that they're now practitioners of something that's suddenly become a member of a new category, religion, and that they now have certain kinds of guarantees. Uh, the Buddhist institution starts building first its own universities uh, modeled on kind of Christian or Catholic institutions in other countries. And then they also start sending people to Western Europe to study religion and to try and figure out what religious studies is as an academic discipline. And so uh, it turns out that uh, some of these folks, uh, in particular, a guy named uh, Anasaki uh, Masaharu, uh, uh, he goes to the United States. He studies at Harvard. Uh, he, he studies both um, uh, you know, he's, he's what, what religion is, basically, and then does a series of comparative works. And this is all part of a process of a kind of series of transformations within Buddhism, where um, not only is Buddhism being compared to religion, but Buddhist leaders themselves lead uh, an anti-superstition campaign, an internal one, where they try and get rid of the parts of Buddhism that they see as backward, not really religious or as superstitious uh, or as, um, you know, outdated science or, or what have you. Um, uh, but it means at the end of the day that uh, just to take us back to the category to religious studies that Japan had one of the earliest um, had a very early religious studies um, institution, a disciplinary home. Um, and this began to change in significant ways uh, the status of Buddhism writ large. So especially when Japan reach, beats Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. Um, people start getting in the West, start getting really interested in Japan and Japanese uh, uh, culture more broadly, but then more specifically Buddhism. And really this asserts Buddhism status as a quote unquote world religion uh, in, a, in a new way. Um, and Japanese thinkers uh, have some agency there too. Yeah. And teaching of religion in America, what's your experience has been like? Like the kind of students that want to study it, the kind of questions you get or pushback? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm in a I'm in a very um, secular institution. So even though uh, you know Williams College, which although it has a historical connection to um, global mission, is is very secular, and our religious studies department is similarly so. So we tend to teach it. Um, a lot of my colleagues tend to teach it specifically in terms of kind of history or sociology or anthropology of religion. Um, I, but uh, one of the things that I do, I, I'm much more interested also in philosophy more broadly and in Asian philosophy more specifically. And I like to teach students things that make them, you know, draws their attention, makes them wake up, makes them not take things for granted. So I teach a course, for instance, called The Meaning of Life, where we read, you know, uh, some theologians, some philosophers, 
uh, from all different parts of the world and, you know, existentialists and um, Buddhist thinkers and uh, uh, Kierkegaard and what have you. Uh, and, and that kind of provokes students in this kind of status of questioning. And I think that I, I like to lead them into that kind of uncomfortable place. Um, I don't know if I can speak representatively. I think in the United States, there's a strong split between institutions that have a religious affiliation uh, and, and teaching religion there is probably something very different than what it's like in the secular institution that, that I teach it in. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know what else to say. I get we get a lot of students who take our classes in the religion department, but not very many students major or concentrate in religion. I think that they're mainly um, interested in broadening their minds uh, and, and in challenging um, the kind of business focus or pre-professional focus of many of their other courses. And so I think that they get a lot out of being confronted with either deepening their own faith or coming to understand their own faith in a more critical way, or uh, in my courses more often encountering other traditions and uh, for the first time and, and gaining kind of more breadth. Um, yeah. You mentioned the meaning of life. What's the uh, philosophies that you tend to be drawn to? Because everybody's always I, trying to seek the meaning of life. What's some of the ones you've you've liked? Some of the, the uh, um, well, for me, yeah. I mean, I I like to. Well, I'll, I'll say um, I I really like to leave it with more questions than answers. But the ones uh, I I'm drawn to um, to teach what I love to teach. I like to teach Aristotle to them. I think that that uh, gives them something very interesting and fundamental. I like to teach a Buddhist philosopher named Shanti Deva, who uh, is very important for arguing for the importance of compassion uh, for the meaning of life and kind of um, a kind of broad kind of uh, ability at compassion and empathy. Um, uh, um, is a, a very broad uh, tradition. Um, I also like to teach the um, uh, Marcus Aurelius is a, is always a blast in that course. Uh, and then I also teach some social justice stuff uh, on the meaning of life uh, uh, for, for people like Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and Cornell West, uh, both who have uh, really uh, great arguments for that. I, this last time I taught um, Bell Hooks, uh, who has uh, some some really fundamental uh, and fun stuff. And then I teach also, you know, um, some thinkers who um, argue. Um, yeah, and you know, from a range of different traditions, basically, I try and give them um, what could be a, a world religion survey, yeah, uh, in mm -hmm. in one way or another. Um, you know, um, uh, although I don't frame it that way, because I'm not trying to give them systematic knowledge, but rather a little bit of in depth from one thinker here, one thinker there, one thinker uh, in some on some other place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I last taught that course in the fall, but that's what I remember. You know, the 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 fun of uh, of teaching that. Yeah, and your book. The, were there people that pushed back against your thesis, the invention of religion in Japan? Did you have sort of uh, main criticisms? Um, I had, I mean, that book was actually really well received, more well received than uh, I had anticipated. Uh, in part, uh, I had been giving talks on it uh, for, for a while because it had been my dissertation. And I had like the firsthand disagreements from everybody in the field kind of orally, and then I was able to work it in. I, I made it very defensible. I think it's very defensible that things changed in Japan from this period. Uh, I think that the pushback uh, has been, the only pushback or the main uh, line of pushback have been folks who um, either think that, who, who mistakenly think that I'm saying that, uh, I don't know, Buddhism didn't exist in the period before the 1850s, or there was like one dude uh, who really didn't like my take on Shinto, who wanted to describe Shinto as uh, fanaticism. And he had the idea that all religion was bad. And his book had been about how um, comparing 9-11 and kamikaze pilots. And he wanted to make this sort of really reductive argument that the one thing that was bad about Shinto was fanaticism. And it just... Uh, uh, and and he he wrote one of the only negative professional reviews of the book. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, folks were um, you know there there might have been some uh, you know spirited discussions here or there, but the reviews were all really positive and it won a major award. Um, so I was really delighted at the reception of that book. Uh, even folks who were like you know um, who, who disliked some of the framing found the archival work and the translations and all that very, very useful. And part of what I'd done was excavate and translate a lot of works that had never been translated before. And I think the field, folks in the field really appreciated that. I both did Japanese sources and then I also translated some Portuguese and um, Dutch and even Catalan sources from the early encounter that hadn't been translated either and a little bit of Latin. Um, and so people were excited about that too because it gave them access to things that they didn't otherwise have, yeah. Excellent. Now we talked before about superstition. You have another book, uh, the myth, the myth of disenchantment. Can you explain that book to us a little bit? Yeah, so that's the book I I wrote um, next. Uh, it's called uh, The Myth of Disenchantment: Magic, Modernity, and the Birth of the Human Sciences. It's on my shelf, but just out of reach. I'd have to stand up to get it. But um, um, it has a cool cover. Um, 
So, you can show it what, if you want to. Okay, wait, let me. Uh, let, uh, we'll let me go to a it. commercial break while you're gone. Uh, I think I can. Wait, oh, there. Uh, so um, it's that's the cover for that one. Um, and um, uh, although it makes me want a mustache again, but my wife told me no more, no mustache. Um, so uh, that book. So so to take a step back about that book, um, I'll give you a sense of its broad argument. So uh, I was in Japan trying to do research for what was going to be my second book, and a the um, it was during the 2011 tsunami uh, and uh, uh, attendant Fukushima disaster, and I was hanging out with folks talking about that project, which was going to be about ghost belief in uh, in Japan, basically, and and belief in talismans and and stuff like that. And um, I was hanging out in a tattoo parlor, getting some touch up on some ink, and a uh, European guy said to me, "Oh, you know, um, you know," I was explaining to mostly folks in Japanese what I was researching because they was sort of a small talk moment. Um, and um, he was like, oh, you know, that stuff doesn't exist anymore in Europe. Europe is, uh, has been totally disenchanted. It's Asia that's mystical and has spirit belief and what have you. And that seemed, you know, incredibly improbable to me. And in part because my grandmother uh, was a famous anthropologist who um, came later in life to believe in indigenous spirits and uh, uh, went, quote unquote, native uh, on uh, the Paco Reservation in New Mexico. And uh, she had people coming to visit her who were, uh, you know, academics from uh, a range of different places in Europe, uh, Mexico and um, North America. And they often, you know, shared belief in kinds of spirits and, and ghosts and what have you. Um, and so I started to wonder, you know, how and then I did some sociological research, and it you know turns out that according to some measures, about seventy five percent of people uh, in uh, the United States believe in some kind of quote unquote paranormal belief. Um, and so the question, and and there's comparable levels in Europe and in Asia, even when levels of church attendance and other measures of secularization are quite different. So in contemporary Great Britain, or uh, or even more striking example uh, in contemporary Czech Republic, I didn't put this in the book, but uh, some later research, you know, in the Czech Republic, one of the highest numbers of belief in atheism atheism or highest number of people to self-identify as atheists, but it also has comparable, a large number of people believe in the reality of ghosts uh, and uh, engage in various kinds of um, what we might call magical or new age practices. And so the question became for me, how do we get the idea that the central feature of modernity was that people no longer believed in spirits, magic, or myths? Uh, and then I found myself in Western Europe and I had a, a, a fellowship there. Um, and so I was lucky enough to be able to relocate uh, uh, to Germany. And I um, ended up going through the lives, uh, the diaries, the letters, uh, the archives of these famous theorists of disenchantment, the people who said that that, that modernity meant the loss of belief in magic, spirits, or myth, and what have you. Um, and I discovered that they made these arguments in the 19th uh, century and good part 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, but alongside occult and spiritualist revivals. And often those uh, revivals entered their own lives. To give you a concrete example, um, the idea that modernity is rooted in the disenchantment of the world uh, is uh, attributed often to the German sociologist Max Weber, who argued, uh, who described history in terms of the Entzauberung der Welt, the, literally the de magic king of the world. And it turns out uh, from looking at his diaries and letters, that uh, he came to that phrase after having vacationed at a neo-pagan commune, and that he knew that many people in his contemporary environment did in fact believe in magic and ghosts and enchantment. And so um, it ended up, anyway, so I, I then ended up, ended up uh, thinking about that in that book and coming to challenge this whole narrative that modernity meant uh, disenchantment. It's just not true sociologically. And then there's a lot of historical reasons that they're different, uh, different wrinkles of that and they become, they were self-defeating in or, or, or um, were self-refuting in different Kinds of ways yeah and so that involved archival work mostly in, in uh, france germany and great britain um uh and, and uh and austria and it, anyway traces a narrative of, of that story about the west that it tells mm -hmm. about itself oh, we have someone here talking to us about how they find it interesting that you know there's less and less uh, religious uh, support so you know the, the number of people who uh, say that they're christian has gone down in Australia, but there's still a lot of people who love watching shows about angels and all of those uh, uh, those things. Can I ask you, when you did your um, your other book on religion in Japan, your view on Christianity did it change at all? Because we always, you know, hear these kind of stories about yeah, a lot of people don't like Christians because they tend to show up at places and say your religion's no good, ours is better, and that sort of stuff. Did you did, did this just kind of reinforce? that kind of narrative? 
Or did you go, oh, um, actually, some of them are okay, some of them not, <laughs> not so good? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the biggest change, so I grew up, my family are um, Jews and Buddhists. So I grew up uh, in, in that kind of um, milieu. And I... Um, I, I really, uh, but what really changed my view of Christianity is I, I did my master's program at Harvard Divinity School. And um, uh, I had gone there to study Asian religion, basically, was the category that they called it. And uh, but, it, but I had to take a bunch of courses on Christianity. I'd never studied it in an institutional academic setting. And I encountered a bunch of really great people, lovely professors, lovely fellow students, many of whom were very ecumenical, uh, who were from uh, liberal Protestant traditions mostly, but some great Catholic folk as well, uh, from various uh, minoritized backgrounds. But also uh, I, I was friends with someone who was part of a big um, queer uh, Christian students movement. And that really uh, opened my mind toward a, toward a new side of, of Christianity, really, um, you know, some really wonderful people, some of my closest friends, uh, uh, you know, one, one of my closest friends even today came, comes out of that moment. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, she's, a, you know, a liberal Protestant, you know, uh, of one sort. And so I think it was that um, even more so than, than doing my research that kind of changed my orientation uh, toward, toward Christianity um, more broadly. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I do feel like an anthropologist around uh, Christians, uh, but uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, Christians would feel uh, like an anthropologist around me. So you know, yeah, mixed history, and in, in, indeed. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. Yeah. Loved every oh, minute sure. of it. Really appreciate you sharing your your many insights with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.